Welcome, everybody. It's time for another episode of Driven by Design, the only show that shows you the future of automotive design, one conversation at a time, with our driven designer, Brian Thompson. Hey, Brian. Hello. We're ready to do this today. Yes, sir. So, well, we, we've been trying to get this one on the books for a while here, so I appreciate we got two great minds together here, two wild topic, topics. Uh, take us there, Brian. Who'd you, who'd you bring along today to talk with? We've got David Macon today, um, and I'm really excited about this because, um, you know, in this world of automotive design, there's mass production and then there's limited run production. And I love, love, love seeing people who create uh, vehicles from scratch that are pure, pure statements. And honestly, I don't, I don't know if anybody does it as exciting as well as David Macon does. Let's, let's let him say hello. <laughs> hey, guys. How are you guys? We're good. And this is the star of Toy Makers. For those of you who've seen the TV show like I have, you guys are making some high-end toys down there. Yeah. You know, we're really, really great. You know, it was, great to have you on there. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. We're truly blessed. I mean, to be able to be surrounded our, ourselves with the right people and the right tools and be able to do what we do and make a living at it. So, yeah, you know, and I think that's the the dream a lot of people have. You know, when you when you when you see your vehicles on television and they're you know they're loud and they're big and they're amazing. Um, what I love about them the, are they have this sort of visceral feeling. And me being on the flip side of automotive design, where I'm creating work that's like in mass production. Um, what I hear more often than not is when I talk about the future of self-driving cars, people will say, well, I like to drive. I, I love that feeling of, of uh, you know, the loudness of cars. And <clears throat> so do I. And so that's why I'm glad that people like you are doing what you do because it's serving the other end of the spectrum. I, I'd love it if you could just sort of to, to kind of kick this off, talk a bit about just what inspired you to create these cars. Like where, where, where do they come from for you? You know, as a kid, you know, it was always that poster on the wall. Mine happened to be a Lamborghini with Farrah Fawcett in the picture. And when to my era, that was like the hot car and the hot lady, you know. So you, know, you always wanted that poster on the wall. And, you know, when you're shoveling snow in the winter and mowing grass in the summer, it's sort of out of reach. So, But we were racing cars, racing motorcycles, go-karts at the time. But you, 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 you develop into a skill set of, working on your own stuff and going faster. My my grandfather worked for Packard and Studebaker. My dad was a gearhead. He built hot rods. So it was just a very natural fit. I couldn't afford to buy what I wanted. I had to learn how to build what I wanted. And uh, mm, it just, it just sort of grew into a, a lifestyle of what I did. And then I chose a couple of careers that, that also picked, uh, like if I needed to build a transmission, you know, I didn't go get a transmission done. I went and got a job at Amco Transmission, learned how to build a transmission. You know, I did that for a summer. Figured it out. If I wanted to paint a car, you know, I went, went and got a job at a paint shop, learned how to paint a car. Um, mm-hmm. And I did that for a couple of years, you know, and you just end up picking a field of work that lives in your world. It was It was a brilliant life for me. I don't say it was made for everybody, but for me it was – I've really been very blessed and very fortunate in my life. Well, and I love that idea that if you want to do something, you go and learn about it. You know, it's really funny, the parallels there, right? So you, you create hot rods, and you, and you had Farrah Fawcett with a Lamborghini on your childhood bedroom wall. Now, I had Knight Rider and David Hasselhoff on mine. How, how perfect that I would end up designing self-driving cars. So my, you know, the cars that, on my that, wall didn't exist. <laughs> but, you know, you're, but you're right, though. That you're, you're, you're a product yeah. of what you grew up with. You know, and that, yeah. listen, I remember that car very well, and and. The only difference for me now is now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my middle 50s. I love all aspects of cars. I don't care if it's electric. I don't care if it's self-driving. I don't care if it's a flying car. I like them all. And it's learning how to adapt and change with the times and still be current and live up to what I find interesting. Um, and Absolutely. that's to challenge it best. But I love what I do. So. And it shows in your work. Um, one of the things I love about your vehicles, as I was saying when we started, but um, that they're so pure. Um, you know, if, if, whether you're doing a motorbike like the Street Digger or um, even the, the Beast, you know, it's like it's very much a beast, you know. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious. Um, now, so you, you know, you, you clearly were so impassioned by 
the mechanics of vehicles. But when you create a car, you're also creating the styling and the way the car looks and feels, which is um, is, a, is, a, is a huge element of the design process. Do you do that in-house or do you bring people on board or how do you visualize your ideas? Listen, all this started as a child. And from that poster, mm -hmm. I promise you, I, I've got a list of about 50 vehicles that that I'm going to build in my lifetime. And they, mm -hmm. it could be a Matchbox car, a Hot Wheels car, could have been a poster. I see most of that stuff isn't drivable when you look at a Hot Wheels car when I was a kid. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> so it's With the two engines sticking out of the roof that it would be in front of the windshield and stuff like that, you mean, it, so, our it, vision, it, so our it, listeners can understand. Exactly. Yes, like it Hot doesn't, Wheels are... It doesn't, it, exactly. It doesn't make sense. So for me, trying to figure out how to build that in real life and make it, and it, it is about a line. It is about a stance. I've got three mm -hmm. cars sitting in front of me as we speak that have wheels and a body sitting there. And they will sit there for months as I walk by and look at them and tinker with them and move stuff around. It's all about a line. But ultimately, in the end, it's got to be drivable and got to be fast. Um, it doesn't make any good to build a paperweight that just idles mm -hmm. through a parking lot. You know, if it's going to have, you know, my newest car's got 3,000 legitimate horsepower. If I can't <laughs> go out and drive it and use it, what good is it? So Right. It's just like a know, steroided it's, bodybuilder who can't actually lift up a uh, bag of groceries at that point. <laughs> you gotta, like, you're you gotta exactly use those muscles. right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know, for you, me, it, 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 it is about a line and a body. We do it all right here in house. Well, you know, I love one of the things you just mentioned as you were talking. I, I'd really like to call out and dive in a little deeper on it. You said that you'll have a car, body on wheels, sitting in the studio or your shop, uh, and you'll walk by it, and it might sit there for a while, and you might not work on it. Now, one of the things I've often heard, uh, creative people when they're young, they're often told, that they have ADD. And I'm, I'm very grateful to my mom who did not believe in ADD. She believed in the creative spirit being that you work on something for a while and then when your attention span is off, you let it sit and then you go back to it. And my mom always taught me, as long as you're actually finishing something, I don't care how you get to the end. You can have whatever process you want, but just finish your projects. And I, and I, and ra and I was always very grateful that she didn't put me on some medication because I was a I was a really creative kid working on a million different things at once but this thing that I don't think a lot of people understand is that the creative mind isn't linear and I'd love you to, for you to talk a bit more about um, the, the sporadic way you might work on it and live as you said so beautifully you'll live with it and look at it as you walk by could you dive in and help people understand how that process works sort of in the back burner of your mind the, the, the big joke in my shop is I go to bed every night with a question, every night, because I'm mm. so tired. I put 12 or 14 hours a day in, and my mind is tired. I don't have the answer. I wake up at 3 a.m. with the answer every night. It, that's what happens. I start relaxing. I look at my notepad as I sit here at my desk. I look down, and I have a little sketch of a of a, uh, a, a vehicle that is in my mind, and I'll look mm -hmm. at that sketch and change the sketch periodically over time. You're right. I got a million projects that I'm working on, and it isn't that I I don't want to finish them. They're not right in my head yet. I got to truly yes. get it built yes. in my mind. The lines got to be right. I got to walk away. Got to step away. Look at other projects. Work on other things. Maybe I go to a car show and get an idea. Um, then I come back and as I'm walking, I might be walking by out of the bathroom and go, oh oh oh, and man, I'll stop everything I'm doing to go back to that project. I, yes. I think you're right. We didn't have ADD when I was a kid. You know, we, we, we no, we didn't, didn't have those exist. terms. It, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, I we, think it, what yeah. it does is it tells people that there's something wrong with them, when in fact it's a very healthy, creative way to be. You know, I, I think about, I, I love the way you just said that about, like, you know, it might come at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, and, and as, a, as, a, as a freelance consultant now with a consultant of my own, I don't work in a studio. But when I was at Nissan and I'd be working on a, on a car, you know, the clay model, I'd pull in my Volkswagen Westphalia camper bus at night into the studio and sleep there. Mm -hmm. So that when I woke up in the morning, it would be the first thing I saw. And then, you know, I'd go take a shower in the lockers. But one of the things I miss about that is that when I go visit a client and see the clay model, let's say, you know, the other side of the planet somewhere, I look at it for two hours, and then I leave, and it's that it's that moment of being around it when you're not thinking about it that I just love. And I was like, I keep telling my clients, let's bring the models over here. We need to live with them, you know. And I think it's that it's that living with it. I, it seems like you you do that so well. I I really do, and and, and even more so is 
I didn't realize this till I had another. I, you know, I have a son. He's 14 years old, and a couple of years ago, he was di- diagnosed with uh, dyslexia. And mm. when they were doing all, I realized very quickly that, oh my lord, I have dyslexia. I had no idea, no idea at all. You didn't know, I, yeah. I, I didn't know, but it, it. I always came to answers in, in a non-practical way. Everybody thinks inside the box. I don't believe inside the box. I don't believe it. Um, I believe that, that there's nothing wrong with people that think inside the box. But anybody can get to an answer. doesn't matter how you get. I used to get in trouble in school because I got to the answer the wrong way. Um, mm-hmm. I believe in thinking outside the box. That's what's innovative. I believe in failure. I believe you have to fail to succeed. I believe you cannot win a race if you don't lose one. Um, Absolutely. I believe you have to... You have to really, to, to be an innovator, you have to do things that aren't practical and aren't inside the box. Otherwise, well, and, and the box does itself, it. and the box itself yeah, is I, a mental construct if you really think of it. I, I was always so really grateful is. for the the studio I, I came up in as a young designer had this policy called um, freedom to fail, and it was and it was really this: it was as long as you're meeting your deadline, you know, as long as if you have your main project, you got you got you, you, you perform. You can experiment with anything you want. You can make a you can make a car out of sticks. You, you know what I mean? Right. And, and and maybe the bark from the sticks ended up becoming because what the failure does. Let's say failure is a relative term. But let's say you make a car out of sticks, right? And it's and it's obviously mm-hmm. not going to be a practical car. But maybe maybe the texture of the bark informs the interior fabric. You know, and that, and you wouldn't have gotten there had you not driven down that cul-de-sac. Of a, of a car made out of, bar, of wood, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I to- so, totally so, agree. That, but that's how I think, though. I, I totally agree with everything you just said. It, most people don't do that, though. They, mm-hmm. you, can find, you can find success in your failures, even if it tells you what not to do. It's like there is, a, yeah. there is success in failure. I promise you. So that's a great segue. I'd love for you, because you, you do have such a, a, a bright, shining star of success, and you know, you're on television, and people know you, um, and they see the successes, right? You know, I assume you know, the TV show is so well-produced and focuses on the A to B of how these products come to life. Is there a failure that stands out in your mind that you, you, that you go to when you think of either it makes you laugh or it was something you learned from it? Um, tell me about a, a bright, shining failure and what you got out of it. <laughs> You know, honestly, for me, it's 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 everything everything that I do every day. You know, making television. To me, I build cars. You know, we we do we do the OEM cars. You know, you take a Camaro, a Mustang, a, a whatever you build, and it's simple. It's OEM stuff, and that's easy. Everybody does that. The one-off stuff is what I love to do. Where you, it's a napkin drawing that I've been tinkering with for years. The failure to me is that should be the hard part of what I do. I was mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, thought TV would be easy. I'm just going to go build a car. Walked into mm-hmm. television knowing 95% of what was going to happen. All my friends had TV shows, and this is a cakewalk. After, you know, I'm going into year four. I got a second show coming out now, and I realized after four years, I I know 5%, not 95%. Television's hard. Uh, it is. You're dealing with that aspect, and, and it, it, it's – Hardest thing I've ever done in my life, ever. It's the most rewarding, but it's the hardest mm-hmm. thing I've ever done in my life. So failure is is just thinking that I was going to walk in here, build a car, it's going to make a TV show, it's going to be great. I, I laugh every day about it. I cry. I, mm-hmm. I cringe. I, I mean, you build a car from scratch. I mean, from scratch. Every, I mean, the chassis, the windows, the body, the seats, the pedals, the sh- every inch of the car. Everything. And the producer, and you get done, producer throws cameras in it and goes, all right, let's go for a spin. It's like, wait a minute. Can I test right. it first? Yeah, they, can we, right, no, of course. No, no, no absolutely not. Schedule. You first fire up, you pull yeah. it out of the shop, and you got cameras. So I'm learning how mm-hmm. to drive the car, you know, through twists well, and turns, you know, on camera, it's like like the beast. Mm-hmm. We were talking about the beast earlier. Twelve hundred horsepower, two thousand pounds, and I'm driving it through the Valley of Death in Vegas. You know, <laughs> I'm like my very first test drive. I didn't know if it was going to stay cool. I mean, I I knew it would. We we got a hell of a team, but you, but, that but no, but that first, and you know, and I and I get that's why they want to capture. You know, 
Um, I'm glad you're talking about television because it, it, it's such an interesting medium and because you're telling stories in real time and you're also trying to curate what that story is going to be. I, I was on a reality TV show myself a few years ago where we had to build cars as well. So I know exactly what you're talking about where that moment you're when you're privately creating something and you are testing something out for the first time where it's going wrong. You know, you have these moments of maybe breakdown or, 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 or you're nervous or you're upset, and it's very private. It's a very private experience. But when you're on camera and, and the, you know, no. the shit's hitting the mm. fan and then things are going, well, that's what they want. That's what they want to tell, right? So, like, you're, they're, like it's, it's a very vulnerable place to be. But you do it so well where you allow that vulnerability to be seen, and I think that's why people like you so much because it makes you real. You know. Well, I, I, again, it, it, I, I say it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's the most rewarding. But you got a microphone on and a camera shoved in your face, and you cannot, and you, you, you don't know if the car's going to, I mean, you, you built the suspension and the A-arms and the spindles and the brake systems. It's like, oh, my Lord, you want me to do, and I'm doing 100 miles, like last year, my season finale, I'm doing 100 miles an hour backwards. <laughs> I mean, backwards. I know. I'm the car around backwards, <laughs> and I'm going, yeah. Uh oh, you know, just, and right. the camera guys don't move. You think you, know, you tell the camera guys don't move. It's my job right. not to hit you. You know, it's like, so it's really your job not to hit them. <laughs> they will stay yeah, there. Like, oh, my you know, Lord. well, I, I, I learned some tricks on TV. I, I did learn if you really get really get uh, frustrated and you don't want to be on camera. Now, reality shows a little different than yours because it's your show. Uh, you know, I was a contestant, but I learned that if I sang a copyrighted song. The cameras, they couldn't use that. Oh, yeah, they, <laughs> <laughs> if I was really exactly upset, right. I'd start singing like Rolling Stones or something really expensive, and then they couldn't That's film me. <laughs> but no, funny. I know exactly what you're saying. It's, but it's, but it's that, that, you know, and, and it's that moment of reality. And, I, and actually, I think television is a, is a wonderful medium, too. It, it gets a bad rap, especially some of these build shows for not being real. But the challenge there is to really, is what I found being on the, the flip side of it, on the inside of it, is that um, it's, a nearly impossible task. People are trying to tell a story in the middle of chaos. And one of the things you, you do well is I think the more real you can be, the more you can allow people to see what you're doing, the more of the story they actually get. And, um, and, I, can, and I absolutely understand what you're saying about that being a very big challenge because those very vulnerable moments are right there for everybody to see. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you got to remember, too, you, you bring up another point is chaos. You, you take uh, mm -hmm. my season finale car for this year. It took me two years to build it. I have 40 minutes as an hour-long show, 40 minutes. So you have to build that car on camera in 40 minutes. Plus, you have to tell a story. you got to, why are you building the car? What's the reason for the car? How? So it's amazing. You get two years of build. I built every inch of the car. So you can't mm -hmm. do it in 40 minutes. So you no. can tell a story. And so there's a lot of, it, it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming at best. It's overwhelming to produce, and it's overwhelming, and I think on the flip side, it's overwhelming to curate so that you're really telling the nuggets of the story. And the truth is, is that you will never tell the whole story, and that's why there's no. so much good behind-the-scenes footage. But, but I mean, for a builder such as yourself, I think this is one of the key uh, things people can take away, too, and I'd love you to talk about it, is that, okay, so here you are now. You've, you've created these cars. Um, you know, people know them. They're, they're in people's hearts, especially people that are your diehard fans. But the side of the story that they probably don't, See or know as well. Let's see if they're sitting at home on a Sunday, you know, watching you or, or you know, binge watching your show. Talk a bit about before this happened. Like, where were you in your life where you decided? Like, did this just fall into your lap? Were you at a kind of a job that you had beforehand that you didn't want to do anymore? Like, w talk a bit about that moment of sort of like the early budding of your career where it's full of like energy and it hasn't happened yet. Um, what you know, what sort of prompted you to take these risks? Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. You know, I, a lot of my friends were doing TV or I was involved in some sort of TV show numerous times, whether it was, you know, Jay Leno's show or, you know, all these guys were doing shows. And, you know, I had, you know, where I was helping with a vehicle doing that show or doing something else behind the scenes where somebody called me in to be an expert on or do something. But what what got me was is I was doing a lot of stunt work, you know, for Six Flags, Universal, and whoever it happened to be for the summer, you know, you're making good money or you're, you're, you're doing these different things. But there's no living there, if that makes any sense. You might work for six months, might be off for a year. Um, or you get old and you don't heal like you used to heal if you got hurt. 
Um, and everybody kept saying, look, and you're just a natural. You need to do a TV show. I said, I want nothing to do with a TV mm-hmm. show. It's fake. I don't want to argue with anybody. Nobody in my shop argues. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I, it, it, it isn't what I wanted to do, I, but I I want to build cool stuff, and I want to mm-hmm. I want to be able to. I mean, let's just think about it. I really live the dream. It, it's hard, but I get to build what I want to build. We're around the people that I love. I love the industry in itself, the people, the products, the future of it, where it's going, what it, where it's been, um, and that's that's a passion of mine. So mm-hmm. the television show just became a natural progression as I got older. I could still dabble with what I, what I want to do. I don't have to race anymore. I don't got to get hurt. I don't got to fall off buildings or, you know, fight on camera, if you will, behind the scenes in the stunt world. I could actually live my dream in front of the camera. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it just sort of naturally progressed. I didn't want to. Um, I sort of got talked into it. I had a bunch of producers approaching me going to please do a show. I kept saying no. And one guy finally got to me, and I just said, okay, I'll do it. I, I don't know why. Um, outside of the fact that so you so you were to approached to do it I, <clears throat> yeah you know there's one thing i, I want to little put a little pin in so that we don't forget to come back to it because i, I um when you're ta- you're telling the story here you talked about the future and the past of the industry being um, one of your passions so i'm just giving myself a little reminder that i want to circle back to that but first um when you're doing i love what you said about when you're being a stunt man and you're working in television mm-hmm. two things where you know first you're you're you get you get, it's, it's hard work. I mean, you, you know, it, it goes without saying that stunt work is hard work, but I don't know that everybody really understands exactly what a stunt man does. And you really are putting your body through the ringer, uh, you know, every day. And the idea that you, you know, you, you are now surrounded by this world of television. You're doing what you love, you know, building things and you love doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I think is interesting about that that people can take away is that you – put yourself into a universe where opportunities would come to you versus having that you actually turn down versus having to go chase things down, which a lot of people do. And, and, and it becomes very elusive if you're chasing things, but the organic way that you put yourself in the world of television and cars is it, it may have happened subconsciously for you, but it was a really great way to build the seeds for this future, which is now your present. And, and I think that's really beautiful because now what you've done is since you sort of planted those seeds or you're in that world, the opportunities came to you. Uh, and then eventually, you know, you got, you know, were talked into doing the show and it turns out you have a great, you know, disposition on camera and such. So it's like, um, I think people don't realize that they create the universe they live in almost subconsciously. Do you know? I couldn't, do, do you, do you I couldn't ag- yeah, go ahead. Could couldn't agree more, but you bring back something we talked about early on in this conversation. It's getting outside the box. I loved my mm-hmm. world, but when you're chasing mm-hmm. the job and you're chasing the work and you're chasing the, you know, now it's like I, I get to, to build what I want to build, drive what I want to bu- drive. I get to go out and play in anything I want to play in. I in in I, I've created my. I, I just got outside the box instead of me hunting the job I, I i wanted to create something that would would last forever i could bring my my son up into it if that's what he wanted to do i could create a great avenue for all of my friends and the industry that i love um and, and not well, and you, chase it it would come chase me <laughs> and i love that you you mentioned you know your son being this being something that he could now play with because then you're really talking about not in the esoteric sense, the literal future of the industry you're working in, because he's going to, if he likes uh, and is inspired by your work, he's going to do it in a very different way than you did, right? <laughs> because he's, he's come up in a completely different generation. And I think <clears throat> that is a nice tie-in to creativity in the past and creativity in the future. And, and as you said earlier on in the conversation, we are always influenced by the world that we grew up in. And so that's why oftentimes I find uh, having come up in the analog era and then switching into a digital era as soon as I got into the car industry, I, I see the world very differently in about creativity than the kids in college do today. And I love being around them because I think as a creative person, the last thing you want to do is ever say, well, in my day, we did it this way. Because as soon as you do that, you stepped off the train of creativity and you're just trying to 
replicate what you did in the past. And so I love to be, I know I'd love to meet your son if he's creative and stuff like that. I'd love to hear his ideas on this because this industry is changing. I mean, <clears throat> let me ask you, literally, could you ever imagine a self-driving hot rod? What would that look like? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Something well, crazy I, as I, that. I, I, think, I think about it every day. It crosses my mind. My son at nine years old built a real hover skateboard, um, a real one that worked. Uh, my mm -hmm. son now at 14 is building his first race car. I mean, oh, cool. he's had junior dragsters, that kind of stuff. But he's actually building a full-size yeah. drift car. He wants to go playing with that. Wow! Um, my son is absolutely an out-of-the-box kid, and he's brilliant. He, he's way, way better. And I, I'm humbled at how he, he'll be. He'll go so far past us. And and you're right. You don't ever want to say, "Here's what we did in our day." And people tell me that all the time. Um, and I fight that all the time with myself because I remember when a big block Chevy was a bad boy. Now it, I call mm -hmm. it a flathead. Big block Chevy right. is just a flathead to me. You know, it's like um, right, right. the technology of today. And, and you're right. My season five, my season finale for season five, we're trying to mix a hot rod with electric with, you know, I haven't – the self-driving thing I get – I understand mm -hmm. it's coming. There's nothing I can do. I, I remember when 8-track tapes tapes went away and VHS tapes. And <laughs> I remember yeah. the first TV. And the, I remember I said, I'd never get a cell phone. Now I can't live without one. Um, well, you know, and so, I wonder, you know, but, but therein lies, I always think that that thing of resistance, that point of resistance, when it, when, when it catches in our spirit, what's actually happening, if we're resisting, it really means we're holding on to it, right? And so yeah. what – are out of that resistance, out of that holding on to that thing that we don't are not uh, in line with. Therein lies, I think, a, a moment of creativity. Could you imagine like a world where, like you know, let's say a lot of these self-driving cars I work on, there are spaces where people sit facing each other and there is no steering wheel. But <clears throat> what would be the hot rod equivalent of that space for those people? <laughs> you know, like Listen, you know, imagine, I, I, one I of think the things. About it Go ahead. Every day. <laughs> well, yeah. I think about it every day. You're, you're right, because for me, for me to survive in my world, I have mm -hmm. to be willing to adapt. And I love to adapt because it gets my mind going. How can I make a self-driving car cool? How can I make an electric <laughs> car cool? We know they're yeah. fast, you know, but what's, right. the, what's the allure for somebody my age with a hot rod? It's the sound, mm -hmm. it's the stance, it's the look, it's the all the, the above. To me, a, yeah, for me, a great sounding radio is a, a big cam with headers. That's a radio mm -hmm. for me. That's a um, radio. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's yeah. music. Uh, yeah. It's music. That's music to my ears. I don't care about uh -huh, a literally. sound system. My sound system is the hatters. So, right. um, in a big cam. So, when it comes to electric, we know we got horsepower. We know the car is brutally fast if you want mm -hmm. it to be. It's also smooth. It's also, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a brilliant technology. So, you can take right. that really cool like we're talking about taking a 32 low boy really doing it right almost you know road racing style big front tires big we're making it all i can give it the stance give it the look make it electric but when you take away the driving aspect it's a whole another element driving mm -hmm. today my 14 year old i have a neighbor next door to me i think he's 20 doesn't have his driver's license yet that baffles me right um, baffles me, yeah, that's, me too. Yeah, but that's, but that's, but that's the, future. the kids of today. So how do yeah. we make them cool? You know, and, and we and that's our job. That's our job to stay relevant is to come up with something cool and what's a version of a self driving hot rod. I think I yeah. know but but who really knows? It's it's a matter of watching and learning and listening and and you know, if it's self driving, does that mean it's gonna be electric? Probably. Does that mean it's going to be, you know, I mean, the technology is going to be way off the deep end. But, right. you know, well, you know I love, individuality I love that is that. important. I, I'm there. going to interrupt for one second here. We're going to wrap yes, this segment up here and uh, come back with part two of this right after this. Uh, tell everybody how to get in touch with you, Dave, and uh, and, and more about uh, Toy Makers and the new show coming out. Yeah, you know, we're on all the digital platforms. You know, obviously, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're all over YouTube. We got, we're on the history dot com. Um, the new digital platform coming out. We have a new show coming out on the digital platforms that we're filming now, which is called the Fast Society, which is a mix between, basically, it's fast and the furious, but with real cars, real drivers, real racing. I'm going to live personally in six different worlds of racing, real race cars, real motorcycles that go real fast. 
and oh, wow. uh, it's going to be fun. So it, it's it's and, and it's you know right now it's it's all about digital platforms. So that's where the second show is coming out, and all of the digital platforms and toy makers will be behind the scenes for that. So, Well, we appreciate you spending time on our digital platform here, and uh, we invite you to stick around because we're going to talk the future here in Part 2 with Dave Ankin yeah, from Toymakers right here on Driven by Design. 